A reading today is from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made the heaven and earth. God will not let your foot be moved. He who keep, keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep you. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and coming in from this time and forevermore. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit and the utterance of wisdom, and to another the the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts or healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. Once, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. That comes from the book of Luke, chapter 17. So with that in mind, we are beginning this summer series with the Bible, yes. But we're looking for the gospel outside the leather binding. Because we know that God is not confined to an ancient people. In an ancient book. God is still speaking, or in this case, singing. Because God is still at work beyond the pages, jumping out into life unscripted, like a song that just has to be sung. If you ask me, the mark of a mature faith is the ability to think theologically. That is to develop a lens for which to find and understand God in our lives. Being able to see God in color, beyond the black and white of print. Experiencing God in places that we don't always expect. So the challenge for us is to be willing to enter the song and sing along. To find our role and take our part so that we're not just observers, but we're part of the experience, a part of the action. So this summer, we are going to have some fun with the gospel on Broadway. And we are starting the summer with one of my favorites. I began researching for this sermon years ago. Perhaps my whole life long has been preparing for this moment. But five years ago, I found myself in Salzburg. And while I was there, I splurged on the Sound of Music tour. I was a giddy as a girl of 16 going on 17. So here's a sneak peek of my tour. We dressed the part. This is the tour bus. It is the official Sound of Music tour, but it is one of dozens of tours that you can find in Salzburg. But mine, of course, was the official, so we could sing along. And I think you guys might like it, too, because you're all singing along so well this morning. As it turns out, we are not the only tourists who've headed to the Sound of Music Mecca for tours. 6.5 million people pilgrimage to Salzburg a year, and 
thousands daily sign up for any of the dozens of tours offered to relive the scenes from that famous movie, to dance along the river and throughout the gorgeous Mirabelle Gardens and relive that romantic night inside the gazebo. Well, we did all that and more. Come along with me. So here's the abbey that Mar Maria was a postulant. They were only allowed to film outside of the abbey. They had to film the inside elsewhere. And do you remember Captain Von Trapp's house? Well, here it is. But it was on the water, right? Of course, because you remember they came back from their trip soaking wet, having fallen into the lake, right? Well, it turns out they used one house for the outside of the home and another that was on the lake for that scene. Because in the early 1960s, they didn't have green screens. They couldn't do all this crazy creative stuff. They actually had to film in two different locations to create that scene. Unfortunately, we got to see both of those houses. The gazebo was not a beloved Salzburg institution, at least not when the movie was made. It was actually created for the film. But it's had several different locations over the years because fans of the show would seek it out. When it was in a neighborhood, people would break in just to reenact the scene of the late night love story disturbing neighbors at all hours. So now it's located on site with another castle in hopes that it will actually boost tourism to real Salzburg <laughs> places of interest as opposed to film sets. But we were guilty as charged, as you can see. There we are. We went way up into the hills and saw from a distance where the hills were alive with the sound of music and heard the story of how they filmed it. There were no drones back then, so Julie Andrews took an oxen cart drawn up the mountain on a cold day in May. She twirled alone in those hills while a loud, windy helicopter circled above her to get that iconic shot. She was freezing and she was grumpy, but it was all worth it because she's enchanted millions as she twirled to the sound of music. So we didn't make it all the way up her hill, as you saw a um, slide earlier. We did make it close. In the film, Maria was just off for an afternoon stroll, and then she runs back to the abbey. Remember when she realizes that she's late? Of course, we realized that it would have taken her hours to hike back but she leaps down the mountain faster than a billy goat, or maybe a lonely goat herd. Yodelay, hee hoo. We also learned that when they headed back over the mountain to escape the Nazis by way of Switzerland, they were actually headed back up the mountain straight towards Germany and the awaiting Nazis. The filmmakers probably had no idea that millions would trek back to Salzburg and catch them on all of their artistic liberties. One of my favorite parts was singing through Mirabelle Gardens, and here's Molly and me. We were reliving it. Yes, I did run through that tunnel, and I did also skip around the fountain and hop up and down the stairs. So, go. There we go. But let's back up a little bit. Before there was a film, there was a Broadway play. And before there was a Broadway play, there was a movie. Well, actually, there were two movies. And before there were movies, there was a book. And before there was a book, there was a woman and a family. The Von Trapps were a real family who lived in Salzburg. Captain Von Trapp was indeed a widower with several children, and Maria was a postulant who was sent out to tutor one of his daughters who had fallen behind in her studies because she had scarlet fever. So she wasn't actually the governess for all of them, but she did fall in love with those children who were musical prior to her arrival, so the do-re-mi might be a little bit of an exaggeration. But Mother Superior pretty much did tell her to marry that captain, Although she admitted that she was not in love with him when she married him, she was actually mad at God because she still thought that she should become a nun as planned. But as time went on, she fell deeply in love with her husband and her family. They did become the singers Von Trapp and were very well known. And when the Nazis overtook Austria 11 years after they were married, not as they returned from their honeymoon, Captain Von Trapp, 
refused the naval command position and Hitler's request to sing at his birthday party. Their conscience drove them to escape. They did not flee to Switzerland, as the show suggests, but they managed to get out by train to perform in Italy, and then they finally made their way safely to the United States of America, where the refugees were welcomed, their children were not separated from them at the border, and they eventually found a home here in Vermont. Their house in Salzburg was taken over by the Nazis and became the home of one of the most evil of persecutors, Heinrich Himmler. The Von Trapps never returned. They were so disgusted by their home being tainted by those murderers that they despised so much, they never went back. The show took its liberties, but their real story is worth hearing. Of course, the biographical story of the Von Trapps is only a part of why we love this musical. We love it because the already beloved Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein tapped into their best work in their final collaboration, The Sound of Music. Do you know how hard it was for us to cap the music today? We wanted to sing every single song. I have these puppets right here, and I love the song, High on a hill, a lonely goat herd, lonely you. You guys can sing it with me later. And of course, as a girl, I sashayed around the living room singing, I am 16, going on 17. Is that like totally out of fashion now? You wouldn't do that. <laughs> but we could do it together. We had so many songs to choose from. Every single show in this song is special. Wendy is just like our own little personal Maria in Edelweiss. Every song is so good. That is why every summer thousands of people flock to the Hollywood Bowl, and I imagine they go to other locations as well across the country, because who doesn't want to sing along to those classics? The show first opened on Broadway in 1959, starring none other than Mary Martin, winning five Tonys, including Best Show. And while Mary Martin is definitely a legend, it was Julie Andrews who captured our hearts in 1965 when they made the film. Of course, so much is really due to those creative geniuses that made magic together, that duo, Rodgers and Hammerstein. They made such an impact on Broadway. If we're talking about the gospel on Broadway, these two wrote so much. Hammerstein wrote an estimated 850 songs. Rodgers composed more than 900. Can you imagine that? And the sound of music was their final work that they did together because Hammerstein died of cancer just nine months after it hit Broadway. Well, he may have died, but we know his music never, ever will. Together they left an incredible mark on Broadway, dominating the stage throughout the 1940s and 50s, each with their impressive careers before they joined forces. But what a mark they leave as we remember Broadway this summer. But I think there was something special that happened with the sound of music. Something magical. Maybe even something mystical. It's not really so much of a stretch for us to explore the sound of music in church, because after all, that's where the show begins, in a church. And while this is very much a love story, it's not just about the captain who fell in love with his governess and she him, or even the governess who falls in love with the unruly children and the kids who love her back. This story tells of Maria's love of God and God's love of Maria. She does. She loves God. So she does what she thinks is the most faithful way to serve God. She becomes a postulant and trains to become a nun because she assumes that the convent is where God wants and needs her. And if you love God, that's where you go, right? Only there's one little problem, and they think it's her. <laughs> How do you solve a problem like Maria? She doesn't belong there. And it's clear to everyone. At some level, she knows it too. Otherwise, she wouldn't keep escaping the convent to head for the hills. But that's what she does. She wants to find God in the abbey. She wants to. But she doesn't. She finds God in the hills. She finds God in music. 
when she sings, the hills are alive with the sound of music, she might as well be singing a psalm. There she is, struggling with her life, wondering what to do with herself, while the nuns are wondering what to do with her. And like the psalmist who seeks out help, she too does the same. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? The hills are alive, alive with the sound of music. My help comes from the Lord. This is a psalm. This is a psalm of praise, a a psalm beseeching help because she longs to discern her own path in life. And most of all, she wants to live in connection with God. And for her, God is so obviously connected to the sound of music. God is the music. God is present all around her, filling her heart, calling her to sing, to live, to serve. And if she is able to listen to the sound of music, she will know what to do next. Because really, she does know before she even begins. She sings, my heart will be blessed with the sound of music, and I will sing once more. But even as her heart knows this, she still believes that there's a certain way you got to serve God. So she thinks she has to become a nun. So she rushes back to the convent, thinking that she can just stuff herself back into that box, even though part of her already knows that this will not bring her heart joy. Of course, Mother Abbess can discern what she cannot. She needs to go out and find herself. Begrudgingly, she follows orders and thus begins her journey with the children and then Captain Von Trapp. What she discovers is that God has called her to this family and she can serve God even outside the church. See, she thought she could only do it one way, a way that she clearly didn't fit in. But she kept thinking that if she just tried hard enough, she could fit a square peg into a round hole. And once she did, that cloud would finally be tied down. But you can't fit a square peg in a round hole any more than you can catch a cloud and tie it down or hold a moonbeam in your hand. Maria didn't belong in the convent. But that didn't mean that she couldn't serve God. It didn't mean that she was not called. She needed to be who she was. And when she was courageous enough to leave the abbey, God would be there. Perhaps that's a lesson for all of us. Who among us hasn't tried to be something we aren't because we thought that was the way it was supposed to be? We get this image of what should be, and we need to be exactly like that. Or we think that God is a certain way. We put God in the box. That the only way we can experience God or serve God is by going into the right building, the right place, doing the right thing. The reality is that God meets us where we are and wants us to be who we are, calling us along our own unique journeys. God will be there because God is there, here, We don't have to be something that we're not. And we shouldn't try to be something we aren't. Some of us might be called to ordained ministry, but probably most of us aren't. But that doesn't mean we can't serve God. Lord, help us if that's all that's in church. That's all who's serving God. Because it's all of our responsibilities. That's why at this church, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That's a fancy way to say that we're called to serve, all of us are, and nobody owns the pathway to God. It's going to look different for each of us. For very few, it means serving in a convent. Maybe a few more, it means leading a church or place of worship. But for the vast majority of us, it means serving God in our lives. It means finding and experiencing God in places beyond the church. It can start here, and I, I surely hope that it does, But like Maria learns, you cannot sequester yourself off in some holy place because God is in and of the world. And we can and should be too. So that's really the point of this summer exploration. 
that we can start looking for God in the Bible here on Sunday mornings. But the good news is that God is everywhere, not just in an ancient book and not simply inside a sanctuary. God is liberated and on the loose, working in all things and each and every one of us. This is gospel good news. So we are called to go forth from this place to see God and listen, to open our eyes and experience God in the hills and the mountains, in the ocean, even in the people who we encounter along our journey, to listen to the sound of music and learn to sing a new song. There are no promises that it will be easy. In fact, despite all the feel-good songs, the sound of music tells the tale of resistance. The Von Trapps resisted the regime. Escaping the Nazis was in no way easy. It was terrifying. It could have cost them their lives. We know, we know that for too many it did. But they were called to be who they were, nothing less. To be true to themselves and listen to God's voice rather than to give in and normalize, rationalize, or worse, partake in unjust acts. It took great inner strength and a deep faith in God, but they braved resistance over acquiescence. They listened for the song and they joined in, singing for their lives. Singing for their lives. We may have different stories. We may sing different songs. We may find God in different places and faces. But each of us are called, called to find God, to listen to the music, to take our place and sing our song, to climb every mountain and give all the love we can give until we find our dreams. Amen.